Hey everybody, Joe from Home Crush here. I recently replaced my trusty old Panasonic GH5 with the Sony Alpha 1. Old and busted, new hotness. You can see why in this video. Because no Micro Four Thirds camera met my needs, I needed to not only replace a camera body, but invest in a whole new lens system. Not a trivial decision. After a lot of research, I concluded that there were probably only two options for me. One, Canon's R5 and RF lens system, or two, Sony's Alpha 1 and EF lens mount system. Now for me, and I can't stress this part enough, for me, the Sony system was the clear winner. In this video, I'm gonna outline why. These two cameras really do go neck and neck in most regards. The differences are slim, but potentially meaningful. Now I'm not gonna do an exhaustive review as there are already many of those for both cameras. I'm purely going to focus on the reasons I chose the A1. And then at the end of the video, I'll include test footage so that you can judge for yourself if the picture quality differences are meaningful to you. So the first point in favor of the A1 for me is the E-mount lens system. Perhaps my favorite aspect of the Micro Four Thirds system is how adaptable it is. Because of its 19.25 millimeter flange distance, yeah, 220, 221, whatever it takes, there's almost no other mount that can't be adapted to fit a Micro Four Thirds camera. Conversely, there is almost no other lens system that can take a Micro Four Thirds lens, except, you guessed it, the Sony E-mount. With a flange distance of only 18 millimeters, there is virtually no legacy lens that can't be adapted for use on an E-mount camera. Regardless of the E-mount's physical flexibility, Sony is much more open and accommodating of third-party lenses, and has been for some years. There are a great number of excellent third-party E-mount lenses that are usually more affordable than Sony's equivalent. Contrast this to Canon and the RF mount. There are very few third-party RF lenses, and Canons are really quite expensive. The cost discrepancy is enough that even though the A1 body is $2,000 more than the R5, after purchasing just three lenses, my total cost of ownership is actually lower with the Sony. Now you could argue that it's easy enough to adapt legacy EF lenses to RF bodies, but that's also true for EF lenses to E-mount bodies. Number two, video friendly features. Let me acknowledge that this is a broad topic and my argument is only supported by a litany of very small features. So this isn't an easy to define, let alone decide category. You're making my head hurt. Can I just go get a Pop-Tart? Certainly the R5 has some video friendly features that the A1 lacks. Internal raw recording is a big one, but overall the sum total of all available options tilt in the A1's favor. Again, at least for me. Let me give you two examples. Number one, customization. Day one simply lets me assign more video functions to more physical buttons. Plus it has two different layers of user-defined menus. Number two, white balance. Setting video white balance is a ridiculous process on the R5. It's a good example of the microaggressions present on the R5 that signaled to me that Canon only begrudgingly includes video features in its hybrid cameras. Finally, the big one for me, color. Yeah, really, color. If you haven't used the newest generation of Sony cameras, this assertion probably shocks you. Sony is infamous for weird, hard to grade color science, especially sickly green skin tones. While the vast majority of people find Canon's signature orangey red push pleasing. So when I say that the Sony A1 has the most accurate out-of-the-box color I've ever tested, that means something. Is it the most pleasing color? The most natural? The most cinematic? Who the hell knows? Those are completely subjective terms people use to describe personal preference. Nobody can tell you not to like Blackmagic's brownish greens or Ari's muted highlights. You be you. But for my part, I prefer cameras and lenses to be as transparent as possible. I don't like my tools imposing a fixed look on my work. I don't like having to switch cameras or lenses from project to project to get a different look. I like to build my own look on set and then finish it in post. Give me great art direction and a clinical lens any day over crappy production design and lighting, but some cool vintage lens. The Sony A1's color is accurate. It's balanced and it's predictable and not just when it's perfectly exposed. It holds extremely well when both over and under exposed. It also handles very saturated, out-of-gamut colors, like those from RGB LEDs, much better. 
gosh, what am I saying? I prefer, in this shot, Sony's S-Log compared to Canon's C-Log. Now, the R5's color isn't bad, it's just not as accurate, and it just doesn't survive large exposure corrections as well. So those are my reasons for choosing the Alpha 1. It would be just as easy for someone else to find three reasons why the R5 is a better camera for them. But again, if you're faced with a similar purchase decision and you have similar priorities as I, then I hope this video, especially the test footage you're about to see, will prove helpful. If so, you know the drill. Like and subscribe. Okay, so here's our test scene. It's been designed to reveal a lot about a camera or lens. On the far left, we have our subject. For a typical Caucasian, the right side of their face will be a tad overexposed. For someone with darker skin, the left side of their face will be a tad underexposed. Next, we have an Edison bulb that will almost clip, but not quite, if a camera has at least five stops of dynamic range above middle gray. Below it are three pure, low-power RGB lights. They reveal how well a camera or color science handles super-saturated colors. Above them, we have a chart that can reveal interference patterns, and then some primary and secondary color samples. In the middle, of course, we have the handy-dandy color checker chart to evaluate white balance, grayscale uniformity, and overall color accuracy. A little farther to the right, we have some tertiary colors, and fine details in the focus chart, yarn, and bottles. Along the bottom, we have a variety of textures to help evaluate micro contrast, including some synthetic black cloth that is also good at revealing IR pollution. Moving to the far right, we have three different blues that cameras often push. And then finally, an area of deep shadow, including dark color patches on the spider checker chart that are particularly good at revealing color noise. All three cameras are using identical settings, and all of their log images are being transformed into Rec. 709 with their respective color space transforms in Resolve. YouTube compression will probably hide it fairly well, but it is obvious in the source files that camera A is the noisiest. Camera B is just a little cleaner than camera C. Camera A handles out of gamut color pretty typically. It lowers saturation and twists the hue to stay in range. This is most noticeable on the blue LED. Look at how it shifts from 2 violet to 2 cyan. Camera B takes a different approach. It sacrifices even more saturation in order to keep brightness and hue looking natural. Now, whichever approach you prefer, it's clear that camera C handles the situation poorly. Both the red and blue LEDs reveal obvious artifacts. All three of these 8K images have plenty of real detail. Camera A has the least, while Camera B reveals the most fine detail, even in moving images. All three cameras handle underexposure pretty well. Camera A gets a little flat and noisy when the underexposed images are covered, while camera C gets a little too contrasty. Camera B kind of rides the middle. Overexposure. Camera B is the clear winner when overexposed. It retains the most highlight information and has the least noise. Camera A fares the worst. So which camera was which? Camera A is the Canon R5, recorded with the internal RAW codec. Camera B is the Sony A1, recorded with the internal H265 codec. And Camera C is the Canon R5 again, 
but this time recorded with the internal H.265 codec. Which did you prefer? Now I'd be remiss if I didn't end this video with a reminder that ultimately, the best camera is the one you actually use. So get out there and crush it.